give you a perfect example of drugs. I went to a concert the other night. We were waiting outside the door. Now, in most situations, you know, I mean, like before a baseball game or something, the people you're with are the only people you talk to. We were just standing around a group, and two people came over to us and asked us if we wanted a couple of joints to smoke, and a couple other people came over to us, and everybody in a minute, 100 people around us, were all talking to each other and mixing, and the next thing I knew, I was 10 people away from my friends. I mean, you just, you, it's, it's a way to get to know people if you're smoking, you're with people. It's, uh, I mean, one guy came bouncing over to me with a big, wide smile on his face, really high, and I said, wow, you're giving all this dope away. And he said, he said, yeah, like, wow, it's, I love giving grass away. It's more fun than smoking it. Make get people to get high and feel good. I mean, it just, you see, but that's the thing. What I'm concerned about, even with grass, he says there's nothing wrong with grass. Well, I disagree with that. Grass, no matter how you put it, is when you smoke it, you get high. And getting high is great. Getting high can be pretty interesting. You can learn a lot, I'd say. But getting high cannot become a way of life. You can't smoke when you wake up in the morning and smoke after your first two classes and smoke at the end of the day and smoke at night. And grass, the higher you get in grass will be a state of mind. I don't think that's good. And many kids do that. They smoke grass 24 hours a day. That's one thing I'm worried about. How about the issue that you're on a bummer and you got a problem with a bad drug reaction? Where would you go in your community to look for help? Would you go to your parents? Would you go uh, That'd be to the, the last place to go is your parents. Why? Because you can't talk to your parents. As soon as you mention drugs to your parents, they flip out. Especially, and if you're on drugs, your parents' reaction would completely destroy you. If I went to my parents, they wouldn't know what to do. You know, they just, they just, you know, they, they wouldn't know what state I was in. So all they'd start doing was, you know, give me all the shit of, of what they're going to be doing to me in the future, you know? I can go home straight and have my parents hassle me, and I, the first thing I want to do is run off and get high and just be happy again. I'm all depressed and everything's falling down in my head. I don't have to be high to have Isn't this there a point where a parent probably has a very good right to hassle you? Not in the way they do it, though. Man. I mean, they're not cool about it. They just start yelling at me like they know it. I come home and one of them gives me a different attitude. Ah, this is about drugs. I read this today. I'm an expert. I read this and I read that and I know. She doesn't know nothing. She's never experienced parents this. Parents don't sit you down and say, gee, like, I mean, first of all, if a kid comes home when he's high, you ought to wait till he's not high so he can talk to you. And then about a subject like drugs. And so, like, they don't bother to sit you down and say, gee, why are you doing it? Can't you find this? Can't you find that? Instead, they yell at you. You smoke any more of that grass, and you're grounded, and this and that. And that's why you're doing so bad in school. And you got to stay in and do your homework. You know, like, who needs that? that doesn't, that's not going to help them get off the drug. They don't, so they don't bother to understand. They just, they, they know, like Bob says, they know. And they're going to tell you where it is. Isn't this act of, of maybe yelling at you, uh, screaming at you, in some way? All right, maybe it's a feeble expression, but it is an expression of concern and love. Because I think concern and love go together. I mean, they, they say, wow, they're really concerned for you. And so, but instead of trying to discuss with you what, what your problem is and what you, what you should do to cure it, they tell you. They, well, they tell you exactly. Is the drug the way to cure a problem? This is what I'm getting at. This is my concern right now from what I'm hearing. When adults learn to leave you alone a little bit, then you're not going to need these escapers, which is all it is. Drugs are escapes sure. from reality. Your parents, you go home and you get hassled. Ah, you don't have A's and B's. You should have A's and B's. You come home with A's and B's. You should have straight A's. So you go off and, you, and you're all depressed and you smoke some marijuana. You get with some friends. You start laughing. And you're happy. And, and things are cool until you go home and it starts all over again. Last period of school, say, you get an F on a math test. You find out you might flunk for the term. Uh, you get out of school Friday afternoon. There's not, nothing immediately you can do about math. You can't go home and study for four hours. So why not go out and get high and try and forget about it? If you stay straight, you can't forget about it. The teachers that you know, what would you want them to do? What would you want them to be able to do to assist you? I'll tell you what I want them to do. If I went into a class and there were several of us who were friends and we went in high and the <laughs> teacher discovered it, if that teacher was to say to us, would you people come to my apartment or meet me somewhere and let us talk and understand what the problem is? Rather than, I'm calling up your parents and telling them. If they would sit down and try to find out why you're doing this. Because there has to be a reason. You're putting the, uh, the whole problem is on the teacher. And that there's no problem that we have as far as the student Go goes. I believe the teacher has to make the first move. Because most students do not trust the teachers. And until the teachers show that they're interested in, in regaining that trust, then the student's just going to continue doing what he's doing. I had a kid in my chemistry class last year. She used to come to class high, class really stoned. Chemistry teacher found out. 
Rather than trying to sit the kid down and talk to him, you reported the kid to his house. The housemaster called home. The parents had to come in. Obviously, you come to my class high because you don't like it. I mean, like, what's the matter with it? What can I do to make it better for you? Yeah. Doesn't give a damn. All these idiotic teachers, these really stupid people that are constant, that I really hate, you know, they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off, you know. With the drug problem, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Why don't they look at themselves, you know, and see the school, the, the, all these kids in the school, the school has so much bearing on the kids, you know. It's so much a part of their life. You know, why don't they look at themselves and see what the school is doing to these kids, you know. They're running around as if some exterior thing is doing all this, you know. Is making these kids turn to drugs and all this, you know. I don't, you know, they're so naive that they can't look at themselves and, and see, you know, maybe it's a school that's doing it to them. Another thing that really has to change is people are going to have to start trusting other people. Because I think that right now society <coughs> kind of teaches you not to trust somebody else. That, that you don't just trust somebody. You have to wait until they, you know, really prove beyond any doubt that they're worth your trusting. The fact that they're just another person, they're a human being, isn't enough. I don't know, it's just like people don't get along as well as they should, as well as they could. I'm charged with breaking and entering. It was into the house of my grandmother, which wasn't too good. And the money that I used from the break was to buy drugs. Uh, heroin in particular. I've been doing heroin for about three and a half years. From 19, I'm in for possession of heroin. This is the second time I got busted up 17. I got busted once when I was a juvenile for heroin and cocaine and uh, for breaking an entrance. Juvenile. Uh, how, uh, how much heroin were you taking? It differed, you know? It depended what time of year it was, how much money I had. I was taking about as much as I could afford. How much was that? Ten dollars a day, fifty dollars a day. You know, as much as I could afford. Well, you know, and stay with enough money to have some for the next day. Well, I started taking downs, I just, you know, heard that it was something like it, and I liked downs a lot, and I just tried it and liked it and kept it up. Uh, how long have you been taking here? For what long period of time? A little over a year. You shoot it? Yeah. Uh, how long have you been in, in, in jail right now? Just a week. Just last week, I have. Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen to you now? Well, I'm trying to get into a rehabilitation center and get cured and come to court and get my charge dropped and see what happens. Do you, do you think you have to be cured? Do you think you're really into it? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Well, how? What do you mean? Well, I just have to be high all the time. You know, can't leave the house feeling right. And if I do leave the house, I'm not high, it's to go get drugged, usually. Mm -hmm. I'm just high all the time by one thing or another. Are you able to work when you're on drugs? I have, but not for, I don't know. I guess no. No I work. can't work. You can't work? No. The more I got into it, the, the less I was looking for a job, and the less I cared about a job. So I guess I can't work. I couldn't really go to school. I could, you know, live out in the street and stuff. What do you and think motivated you to start taking heroin? All the, all the people in the corner that I used to hang around, you know, like, they were doing it. And, you know, like, they were shooting Demerol and stuff. So one day, they, you know, I asked them for some. And I liked it. And I got into it then. Uh, what motivated you to take heroin? Uh, Wanted to find out about it, curiosity mostly. Then I think I just started liking it. Some take it to have a good time, some take it because they've known nothing else for a long time. And just like to be high. It helps. Makes things easier. 
And then there's the kind that just you know, do it like it was drinking, you know, on Friday night. Just all different reasons. You can relate them to alcohol. When you're addicted to heroin, you don't stop living. You just start living another life. You start living the heroin life. You know, copying, and, you know, getting off and stuff. I mean, you're still living. But you think, that dog, it's, an, it's, it's an easy life. It's an easier life than yeah. maybe some other kinds of life. It's a very easy life. I don't, I don't have much of a problem with it. I don't think it's that easy. I think it's, you know, I mean, you're living your life for one purpose, you know. In that way, it's easy. I mean, life's complicated if you don't get no cop outs. There's other things that you'd like to do, but, you know, comes time to cop and that and thought goes away. Just have to get high. So that's what I mean by easy. You have one thing you have to do. Like, you don't have to do two or three things. You don't have to wake up and go to work and just have to get high. One, pur you know, one purpose. And when you're high, you think all the other things you want to do until you come down and it's time to get high again. You know, like, I mean, this dope thing, if you, if any junkie, if you, you know, I mean, you know, if he's been doing it less than 15 years, if he wants to quit, he can quit. It's just, you know, like, if he quits, he's still back in the same place where he was. Yeah, you know, like, he's still, he's not at ease with himself. You know, like, you gotta be, you gotta be, you know, like, you know, you gotta be oriented, you know, like, to, to life before you can, you know, like, quit drugs. If you're still in the same way, you've still got the same hands, it's gonna do you no good if you quit. Because you're just going to go back to it. I don't know if I'm going to do heroin when I get out. But, you know, it's hard to say. Every time, every time a person gets busted, they say they're going to quit. You know, like, and then when you get out on the street, you know, it's still the same. I don't want to take it when I get out there. You know, I swore to quit, I don't know how many times while I was high. But I just, you know, really didn't have too much faith in myself when I wasn't high. I said I wanted to quit when I wasn't. Like, I've been, the longest I've been away from heroin it was like for two or three weeks at a time. And then it was pretty easy, you know, I had money and I just, you know, didn't want to get high. I wanted to, but it wasn't one-tenth as strong as it was when I was getting off all the time. And then just something would happen. I mean, not a problem, just you hang around one of your old friends and he keeps on talking about it and asks you who's got it and you got a car. And, you know, after 80,000 questions, kind of, let's go, <laughs> let's get high. What sanctuary is, huh? <laughs> it's a place where kids come. We try to have resources there that they need. Doctors, lawyers, we take kids to the hospital. Um, sometimes if kids want them, we try to get them jobs and find them apartments. That's one of the reasons that it's good that it's an open place where kids can kind of hang around for a while, case the joints, see how they feel about us, see how we feel about them. You know, kind of that we have a little, we have time to sort of establish a relationship in a sort of more casual way than it could would have to if he was walking in off the street into a social agency. You know, then well, you have the to say. Well, he wouldn't walk off the street into <laughs> an right? established social agency. That's one of the reasons sanctuary exists because uh, the people that we serve, the kids that we serve, won't go into uh, established social agencies because they're so alienated from establishment or whatever that they just won't do to they rather some of them would rather die on the street than go to uh, to uh, walk into the emergency ward at Cambridge City Hospital by themselves primarily we do crisis counseling but uh, if someone if someone comes in bumming out on acid uh, you don't uh, talk him down and that's the end of it goodbye you know have a nice life or something like that you know you while you if you talk to him for five hours you find out who he is also, we have been able, to a certain extent, to alleviate some kinds of red tape. We've been able to get some kind of more personal treatment. We know people at the agencies that we send people to, and we go right to them, and we try to sort of have a kind of personal touch with whoever we're going to see. And, you know, we also have worked out a, a, a procedure at the hospital to try to get kids as quickly as possible to get the kind of help they need without going through too much of the sort of signing in, filling out forms procedure. We deal primarily with a kid who comes in and tells us about how terrible its home situation is and how miserable it was, and our sympathies are naturally with him. What can we do for him? The police see it from a very different 
angle. Uh, they deal primarily with the distraught parent who comes in. It's all emotional and crying because their child has run away. So the parent's view, or the police's view is, what can we do for the parent? How can we get the child's parent back home? This poor parent who's had a tragedy, it's almost like having a child who's been in an automobile accident. Um, and so I think that, that the primary loyalties of the two groups are different. And therefore, this leads to different um, ideas about how you should deal with a runaway who comes in the front door. This is a group who excludes the law enforcement people. And I think as a law enforcement officer, at 2 o'clock in the morning, a person complains to me and tells me that their daughter is down at a certain address in this city, and I can pin this address to a runaway house, that I, as a law enforcement officer, uh, uh, is duty-bound. And I am obligated to go in and take that child out of there. And if they fail to turn this child over, and I think find the child there, I believe that I have uh, recourse at law in making a complaint for contributing to delinquency of a minor. There's, there's no uh, indication made to us in any way as to the qualification of those people who are alleged counselors in these organizations. And as a parent, I have four children. They range from the age of four to 19. Now, if for some reason my youngster decided to run away and were to seek refuge in one of these places, uh, I, as a parent, would like to be able to feel that if he would not return home or I could not have access to him to get him to come home, that he was at least receiving qualified help for his particular problem. And I don't believe that he gets it there. It is our belief, and it's backed by medical opinion, that a person who is on a bad trip deserves medical attention, not attention from somebody talking to him, and someone who is not that knowledgeable with medicine. And if he is that knowledgeable with medicine, and he is not a medical man, he is now practicing medicine without a license. And that I am interested in. They keep pressing us for our qualifications over and over and over and over again. What are your qualifications? What are your qualifications? Do you have a social service degree? This and that and this and that. And we try to explain to them that there is a new approach to uh, the, prob the problems that we're dealing with or the problems that society deals with in general. And that's to have people working with uh, people uh, working in a program who have had similar experience to the people who they're going to try to help so that they can relate to them. And, uh, and uh, this, is, this is a tremendous advantage when you're trying to deal with a kid, if you've gone through the experience. We even, arguing with the police or discussing this with the police, we brought out the example of Alcoholics Anonymous and how uh, uh, this is a case also where people who have been through the experience can help the people who are going through the bad experience. And they just, uh, they don't buy it. They just, uh, they, they just say, no, you've got to have a social service degree to work with the, in, a, in a social service agency. And uh, if you don't have one, then you're not qualified. A lot of the standard professions, I mean, the medical profession, the social so uh, work profession, and other sorts of things, have never received any technical training in the kinds of problems they have to deal with. In medical school, they don't teach you how to talk a kid down from a bad trip. And therefore, the fact that you have umpteen degrees in, in uh, uh, professional training doesn't necessarily mean that you're equipped to deal with the specific kind of problems that we come into contact with. And the second thing I think needs to be said is that even in instances in which the professions do have that kind of, of expertise, the one thing they don't have is any ability to establish any kind of trust and rapport with the kids to get them to come in. And therefore, all having all this giant physical plant of a hospital with umpteen machines in it, and all sorts of hundreds of people roaming around with degrees and technical skills and all of that, is totally irrelevant unless somehow you can establish trust with the kids. And I think that's, that's what Jack was saying, that we see our major function as being. I can have more rapport with a fellow who is bagging 10 bags a day, sitting on that chair at 3 o'clock in the morning than any guy sitting in the sanctuary or any other place can have with that same man any dime of the day or night, any day of the week. We have done it here, we've talked to them, we've given them medication by bringing them over to the hospital and having a doctor medicate them. We put them in a cell and every time they get the monkey in the back, they take another cell and give them treatment until such time as we can get them into court. And this is done invariably. And I can get just as much information and get just as much of a background from that man as anybody can sitting in any 
chair or sitting on a floor in some storefront operation. I made this statement to them, and I defied them to come with me any night and get anything out of a man that I can't get out of him. Perhaps we sound a little bit cynical about these type of organizations. It's because of the, well, perhaps the improper way that they have been run in the past. And by reason of this, we feel that uh, they are of no benefit to our community. 